you can still buy a really good property for $120,000 that's gonna cash flow nicely. If you get seven of those, let's just say you had seven properties and they're each generating 800 bucks a month. And you know, over time, they're gonna keep building up. You could retire. Most, like an average American is gonna be able to retire easily off of that. On a bread and butter average house that's generating average rents, you'd be fine. Hi, everybody. Jose Luis Morales. Welcome back. Today, we have a repeat guest. His name is Toby Mathis. Uh, Toby Mathis has a book titled Infinity Investing. The principles of the book are how the rich get richer and how you can do the same. And today, we're going to be talking about the foundation, which is how to build residual income and how it relates to his book, Infinity Investing. Welcome back to the show, Toby. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Thanks for having me back. Good, good. Uh, for our viewers who don't know who Toby Mathis is, who is Toby Mathis and how did you get involved in this world of building different incomes of residual? Yeah, so uh, I'm a tax attorney by trade. So I spend most of my day digging into the uh, into the code, the Internal Revenue Code. And my firm, I help found, does about 10,000 returns a year for investors. So over the years, I've just been looking at who are the successful ones and I, I started to notice trends. I've been doing this for 23 years and it was probably about 10 years ago in earnest where we really started looking at it closely, maybe a little longer, but, but really started to notice that the people that are successful over a long period of time and who, who make the most money are doing very, very similar things. And it's contrary to what you hear on cable news. It's contrary to what you hear at cocktail parties, probably. It's actually pretty boring stuff when you get to its core. And it's fantastically simple if you just, you know, so they always say it's simple, not easy. Mm -hmm. This is probably that exact case. It's very, very simple if you do what these successful people have been doing over and over and over again over a long horizon, you're going to get the exact same result. So for our viewers that aren't familiar with the book, Infinity Investing, like what mm -hmm. is the principle of Infinity Investing? Yeah, at its core, it's how the rich get richer and how you can do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, we, we play this game in this country that somehow, you know, you got to get lucky to be wealthy, that there's nothing further from the truth. The vast majority, as in like 90% of people are self-made, 88% of millionaires are self-made. You get in, you start realizing that it's very simple for somebody, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an accountant, real estate agent, fill in the blank. We all are given the same tools and the same opportunities to generate wealth, but it needs to be a long-term horizon. In other words, if you try to get rich quick, you try to cut through and, and skip the rules, you're probably going to have negative re results. And I would say that in our country right now, we have a horrific track record at our retirements like really bad, like whatever they're teaching everybody, don't do that because the vast majority of people when they're retiring are, are retiring and they are dependent on social security, which is really a welfare program. In other words, they're not independent. They're not prepared. They're not ready for retirement. And I would say it's, 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 it's the vast majority of people. And they're following the advice out there by all these so-called experts when in all reality you shouldn't be listening to the expert you should be talking to people that are financially independent and they'll tell you pretty much the same thing over and over again which at its you know i'll boil it down for you invest in assets quit gambling quit going to the stock market casino and instead say i want to go there and buy assets as opposed to the soup du jour that they're serving up every day which is growth stocks Everybody's looking for the next Microsoft or the next Apple instead of realizing that there are companies that have been paying out consistent revenue, the profit, it's called a dividend, and they've been paying it and increasing it every year for, for decades, in some cases, 60 years. And we ignore those companies and instead we're running around looking for the next big one. So let's find the next Tesla. How about not? How about invest in things that pay you, act like Warren Buffett, put on your millionaire cap and say, hey, you know what? I want to make sure that I'm getting a good return on my money and I want to invest in good companies, like great companies out there, the stuff that I use. I mean, if you just drove down the street and, you, and every day you did, you know, you visited certain things, maybe you went to Albertsons, maybe you go to Chevron, maybe you go to the Starbucks, maybe you get a, a, a Coke at McDonald's. If you just invested in all of those things and and hey, I love to go to Costco. If that's all you did is said, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to buy those companies because they're really, really good and I love using them. 
and then you just consistently invested them. You didn't try to time the market. You didn't do all this nonsense that they get you to do on cable TV or, you know, whoever the guru is that's out there telling you to do option trading and all this craziness. If all you did is buy really good companies consistently over a long period of time, you're going to be really, really wealthy. You're going to have a great retirement. If that's all you did, of course, that's not all we're going to do, but, but that's the principle of the book is that we are looking at things that pay you. And it's a, such a simple definition, invest in assets and avoid liabilities. If you have liabilities, make sure your assets are paying for them. It's so simple. So, and, and I love this because um, when I started uh, my real estate career, my broker at the time introduced me to a game called The Rat Race by Robert Kiyosaki. And that game basically told me that if I wanted to in get more liabilities to get the assets first, but I yep. think one thing that I found interesting about a previous conversation that you and I had is that a lot of people rely on the word asset and they always think that an a like a house is an asset, but that's not always the case. They always think that a certain stock could be an asset, but that may not always be the case. So I think that the way that you think about an asset versus a liability is something I had never heard before. So I thought it was uh, interesting. Do you mind elaborating on what you yeah. classify an asset versus a liability? And then we can uh, dig into some, some of the different assets that will pay you residual for people looking to build a residual income. Yeah, it's very, very simple. And I use a, you know, a, a second grader approach. If something pays me, it's an asset. If it takes money away from me, it's a liability. So we could call something whatever we want. I, I define it by its result. If it's putting money in my pocket, it's an asset. So if I buy a piece of real estate, everybody says, oh, real estate's an asset. It's, it's an appreciating asset. I don't really care about the appreciation because my intent's to never sell it, right? If I live in a house, it's my forever house. If I buy a rental property, my intent is to is for the, the income off of it. Well, I am not even thinking about what the value of it does. Why would I care about that except maybe to borrow against it and buy more assets? What I really care about is what it's producing. And so I just look at the result. And, uh, you know, if, if you want some further bolstering on that, look at the SEC's definition of who's an accredited investor. These are people that are allowed to invest in certain types of investments. The rest of us, the plebes, can't. But if you're wealthy, you get to be an accredited investor and they do not include your house in that calculation. And that's because people who are sophisticated know that a house is a liability. It's not an asset. You didn't see that coming? And if somebody ever tells you your house is your biggest investment, it's your biggest asset, just kind of nod at them and say that they're probably not a financially successful person. Because the bigger house you buy, the more expensive it is. In fact, it's about 5% a year. So if you buy a million dollar house, congratulations. Just know that that house isn't putting money in your pocket. It's probably going to take about $50,000 a year off. That's why lottery winners find themselves in, in bankruptcy more than the general population. It's because they buy things that they're being told by their financial advisors to get, and they get themselves in hot water. They buy really expensive cars, they buy really expensive properties, and they play this, this, this bizarre game of, I hope things go up in value. And it doesn't always happen that way. And, and it's funny because um, I, I think in some cases it's more speculative, meaning like I'm hoping that it goes up in value, but th just as much as things can go up, they can go down versus like obviously oh. investing in the cash flow that the asset produces. So I think it's really simple. If it pays you, then it's an asset. If it takes money away from you, it's a liability. I like how simple that is. So what would your book define as different asset classes that you can invest in that pay you? And then what are the pros and cons of these different assets and how can mm -hmm. they help you build like residual to get closer to retirement? Because here's one of the things I see, Toby, in my industry, I sell houses for a living. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of the people that I'm selling their properties that are older in age, they're relocating to states that are less expensive because they failed to build a retirement plan. And a lot of the money that they have is tied up in the equity of their home. So they're going out to like states like Arizona, Nevada, Texas, buying a house for half the price in cash to be able to do it. But mm -hmm. it sounds to me like what you're saying is that there's a formula that they can utilize if they want to be able to retire gracefully, that doesn't rely on the equity of their own home. And that there's other assets that you can be investing in that actually pay you residual. Yeah, one of my struggles as you know, an attorney, and by the way, you mentioned the rat race and Robert Kiyosaki and 
I'm a huge Kiyosaki fan. I bought his book, I think it was in 1998, mm -hmm. and gave it to all my staff. And we did his tax and asset protection for Rich Dad, Poor Dad for about 17 years. Really, really smart guy. But you'd read that Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, and then you don't know what to invest in when you're done. Like you end up staying awake at night going, okay, what do I do next, right? But what you do is you, 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 you focus in on what are my expenses and how do I replace those expenses with anything other than my own labor? You know, so Warren Buffett had a quote, you know, if you don't figure out how to make money while you're sleeping, you're going to work until you die, right? So we want to find a way to replace our income. And so that's the, the, the hardest part is being honest with yourself saying, here's what I spent. And there's wants and needs. And we can always, you know, the, the, there's the Dave Ramsey's of the world that would say, you don't need all this. If, if you have debt, you, you, the last place you should be in is a restaurant unless you're working for the restaurant, right? So like, like, unless you're working there, you shouldn't see the inside of a restaurant. He says, you know, stuff like that. And it's kind of the shaming attitude, right? I got to, I got to cut all my expenses and I do the opposite. I say, Hey, you know, if you want to have the Lamborghini and a beautiful house, you can have it, but you need to have the asset first to pay for it. In other words, if you're going to buy a really nice car, figure out what it would be per month to lease it and then buy an asset that pays for it. So in our world, let's just use real estate because it's a great, it's a great asset. Cash flow real estate is fantastic. It, it, I could buy a house, let's just say that I go, I, I like Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I've been buying there for years. It, it's, it's now, I think it was the second fastest market for rents and all that fun stuff last year. Now people are starting to take notice of it, but that whole tri triage area, you would buy a house, you could buy it for, let's say $100,000. It's gonna produce six, 700 bucks a month in rent. I, I could buy a house, instead of buying a Mercedes for $120,000, what if I bought that house and then had that house Pay for the Mercedes. I am the one, the way your son don't need the gun to get me. So yeah, I'm, I'm using up the money. Yeah, it, it's going to, to cover an expense, but that's a cash flow positive property that then I could use. And maybe I need to buy two of them. Maybe I need to save up for the Mercedes, right? Maybe I don't get the brand new Mercedes right now. Maybe I make sure that I have enough assets. And the beautiful part about an asset like real estate is that not only does the, the, the value of the real estate tend to increase, but the rents go up even during recessions. In fact, in 2008, nine, when, when the rest of the markets were, were, were tanking, Las right. Vegas, where I live, we went down 75%. Rent still went up. People still need a place to live. Even right now, they're talking about this housing crisis. What if it, what if it falls off the roof? There is so much need in this country. The demand is absolutely ridiculous. We're about 5 million units of housing underbuilt sure. in this country. There's always going to be an increase in the rents just because inflation, it follows inflation almost to a T. So you, you have a nice built-in protection there. And so the philosophy is really, really simple. Figure out what you spend every month that, that, that is comfortable. So it might be six, $7,000, and then build up an asset base to cover that. And the infinity in the infinity investing means I never have to work again. I could live in an infinite number of days without selling off my assets. I would live off of what those assets are producing. And you asked a very, really poignant question of like, what are those assets? I would say cash flow, real estate, and dividend paying stocks are my top two. There's lots of others, but what it is not, it's not your house, it's not gold, it's not crypto, it's things that are paying you to own them. And the, again, statistically speaking, when we look at historical returns, it's not even close. The compounding effect of having dividends on a stock portfolio and then doubling it up by renting the stock out, we call that, it's called a covered call. When you add those things, the, the, the compounding effect is incredible. It's, it's how Warren Buffett made his, his billions. Bought Coca-Cola in the 80s right? Coca-Cola has been increasing its dividend now. For the, I think it's 59 years. It might be 60 years. Every year, it increases the amount that it pays its shareholders. Uh, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, I think made more off of the dividends off of Apple than Tim Cook made in his entire compensation. Like you want to be the investor who's getting paid out of the profits of the companies you invest in. That's what makes you wealthy. That's what compounds over time. And you give that 10, 20 years, you're going to be very, very wealthy if you're investing in good, solid assets. Off camera, we talked about five different ways of earning residual. Let's go over the five different ones, and then we'll dig into the two principal ones, which is uh, cash flowing real estate and dividends. And then maybe we can dig into some of the other ones. But just for our viewers to know what to expect, what are the five different ways that you outline in your book to earn 
uh, residual uh, income. Yeah, we, we look at the income, the type of income that's being produced. So we call them infinity income sources. So it's rents, royalties, dividends, interest, and short-term capital gains when you sell an option on a, on a, uh, on a security. We are not option buyers. We are option sellers. What does the term infinity mean to you? I know that you mentioned it off camera to me. Forever. Infinity means I don't have to sell things. I'm not like, I'll, I'll use a contrast. In the financial community, they use this 25 times your annual income mm -hmm. is, is what you need to be saving. So you need to have that 25 times that amount. So if you make $100,000 a year, you need to have 2.5 million saved up by the time you retire and then you're going to live off of four percent a year and they're starting to realize that that's wrong because the markets fluctuate plus your expenses go up inflation can wreak havoc on that mm -hmm. plan plus people are living longer and they're outliving their money and so i i mean i think it's almost cruelty to to our elderly community they can see the end like they're set up to live maybe maybe they maybe they're projecting a retirement of 30 years well what if you live 32 years into your retirement what about those last two years? Oh yeah, you're desolate. You don't have money. Mm -hmm. You're hoping somebody comes in and saves you or, or you're relying on social security or you're gonna die in a nursing home. It's not the right way to plan. So we plan completely differently. I don't believe that you should be depleting your asset base. In fact, I think you should be creating a legacy that lasts hundreds of years. And I don't say that lightly. When I, when I sit down with people and we're doing leg uh, retirement planning, estate planning, legacy planning, I say, project out 200 years from now. What does your estate look like? If you're that normal, average financial planner, they're anticipating that you're going to burn up your estate and you're not going to give anything to your next generation. We don't do that. I look at it and say, why aren't you investing in assets now that don't go away? It's an infinite period of time. I want your legacy to be for forever. How do we get, do that? We buy cash flow assets period we don't speculate we don't go doing all sorts of crazy stuff we invest in things that are going to pay us and if it pays you for your lifetime you can't outlive it and then when you pass it goes to your kids or whatever organizations you care about or to your family and maybe it's maybe you're restricting it and you say hey it's only for education i just want to give everybody in my family my kids my kids kids my kids 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 I want to make sure that they have an education. I can create that. And the way you create it is with assets. You don't create it with speculative investments. You don't create it with things that are going to cost money because nobody's going to keep doing that. You know, you take a look at the family house. It rarely stays in the family. People pass away. It's probably going to be sold because nobody wants to maintain it. And I know this because I buy those houses all the time. We bought, you know, hundreds of houses. We still have about 400 in our portfolio. We buy a lot of times from estates. Nobody wants to maintain it. You know, what they don't get rid of is that rental portfolio that mom or dad put together and they have it held in an LLC and it's a nice tidy thing and it kicks out money. They just keep running it. Hey, it's just producing income. It's a money machine. And that's, and that's, that's what you should be investing in is assets, things that are money machines that continue to get better and better and better the longer you own them. How does somebody find good cash flowing real estate? With math. <laughs> This is going to tick you off, Jose. So oh, I love it. So, uh, so if I went to a realtor and I said, "Hey, how much is this house worth?" They're, you're probably going to comp it, right? And an investor is not going to do that. They're going to say, "What's the cap rate?" Right? They're going to look at it and say, "How much is it generating?" So that the the places where you have high appreciation, you're probably not going to be investing in. You're probably going to invest in places that have great cash flow, which might be the Midwest. It might be. North Carolina, it might be Ohio, it might be Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, I do Oklahoma, I do a lot in Texas. I have a ton of properties down in Houston because they're, they're great bread and butter cash flow properties, right? You can still buy a really good property for $120,000 that's gonna cash flow nicely. If you get seven of those, let's just say you had seven properties and they're each generating 800 bucks a month. And you know over time, they're gonna keep building up. You could retire. Most like an average American is going to be able to retire easily off of that on a bread and butter average house that's generating average rents. You'd be fine. 
Now, when you say that $800, $600 a month, whatever it is, is that leverage or are you recommending that most of these people buy it in cash or does it depend on their situation as well uh, too? So my personal view is I'm debt adverse. So I tend to try to avoid the debt. You want to have a net positive. Now, if you can pay the debt, so the, the, the loan is a liability, and if your asset will pay that loan, in other words, it's cash flow positive, it brings in enough to, to not only pay off the debt, but then give you a little bit of extra, then, then that's okay. But it's going to take you a while to pay off that debt. I would be attacking that debt. And so reality is if you have seven properties that you own outright, you're probably going to be able to live forever and not have to worry about money. A reasonable, like, like you, you, you will not be wanting, like you're not going to need public assistance. And that's the way I kind of look at it. So if you have to buy them with a little bit of leverage, but you have a 30 year note and you pay it off in 15 years or something, and you could do that. That's fine. That's why I say it's a get rich slow and it's 20 years, 30 years plan. Fantastic. If you're buying it and you're going to pay off that debt and you know that, Hey, I'm going to accumulate the real estate and pay it off. And maybe I want to, my target is I want to pay that off in 30 years, but you're able to accelerate that a little bit. That's, that's even better. But let's just say worst case scenario is you pay off all your notes in 30 years. Now you own outright property. It was funny because I learned this principle of cash flow investing in real estate from that that rat race game. And at that time I had a property that produced it had debt on it. It produced two hundred dollars of positive cash flow. My mortgage was uh, seventeen hundred, my rent was nineteen hundred. And then I did a ten thirty one exchange into a different asset that now left me two thousand dollars a month. It was a fourplex instead of a one unit property. Now I'm from two hundred to two thousand. Now that helped my freedom number. You know, it helped me have a passive stream of uh, 2000. So one of the things that we go over with clients all the time is when I hear like, oh, my home or this property, I'm just gonna rent it out. And I ask them about their cash flow situation. In some cases, they're having to put money out of pocket. In some cases, they're breaking out even. And I ask them, if we can move the same money and get you a better return on that money, would you be open to that? And a lot of times, like they have been so trained in a certain way that the house is always an asset when it's not always an asset that they have a hard time seeing that. But I think it's exactly what you're uh, describing. I don't know much about dividends. I don't know much about covered calls. How would somebody go about finding good stocks that, that produce good dividends? And what is a covered call as well too like i have no idea yeah, what that is we make it painfully simple it's it's infinityinvesting.com you sign up for a free membership and then you go through a, a little bit of the education online we actually post a list it's 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 usually about 60 companies that are going to really be in our wheelhouse these are companies that have been paying out their profits so when a when a when a company that you you invest in on wall street so let's say we go to walmart and they make profit and you always see these, you know, hey, they're going to report earnings or whatever. And you have these companies that lose money every year, like Amazon used to lose money every year. Now they're starting to have these huge record profits, right? Uh, but a good bread and butter company has historically been making good cash flow. And then they pay out a portion of it. Let's say they pay 60% of their profit to their shareholders. That's called a dividend. And a thing like a real estate investment trust, they're required to pay out 90% of their cash flow. A regular company like, again, I'll use Walmart as an example, they may pay out half and then they keep the rest to grow their company, right? Or they retain that earning and maybe they're building up a stockpile. Mm -hmm. There are other companies out there that just, they, A, they don't make money. They, they're, they're really good at losing money every year and, and you're hoping that they go up in value. I mean, like, Tesla is, is kind of in that category. They don't, they don't really profit. They're always reinvesting and they're not sitting here paying out big dividends, right? Then you have the Coca-Colas on the other side that they've, they're they just a big behemoth. They make good money. They pay it out. Actually, I'll be fair. Pepsi and Coca-Cola both fit in that category. They And they pay out that money to their shareholders. Now, here's what's interesting from a tax standpoint. So I'm a tax attorney and I look at all of these types of income and they're all better than money that you make at your job. And the reason being is because none of these income sources is subject to Social Security taxes, old age, disability and survivors and Medicare uh, it, or Medicaid. It's not subject to 
those social security taxes. So you immediately save on that. And then things like dividends, they're taxed as long-term capital gains. The tax rate for an average American is 0%. And I'm not joking about that. If you are a married couple making less than $83,000 a year, that's with your standard deduction, which is, you know, 20 grand uh, or higher. Uh, now it's closer to, what is that? 25,000. So if you're in that below $83,000 category area, your long-term capital gains rate is zero. In between about 83,000 up to about a half a million, you're in the 15% and then anything above that's in the 20%. You have a net investment income tax attack on there too at 3.8. If you're making over, again, there's thresholds, but if you are an average American, average American is making less than $94,000 a year as a household and you have your standard deduction, you're probably paying zero on those dividends, zero to 15%, which means that they're tax advantage. Same things with real estate. Real estate's considered passive income, but we depreciate the actual house that's on the land, which means we get to take a deduction as its useful life is, is extinguished. You know, these have long useful lives. There's ways to accelerate it. But the old adage in, in, in the accounting world is if you're paying taxes, it's because you don't own enough real estate. Real estate almost always is going to come to you. The cash flow is going to come out tax free. So then the tax code literally tells you what to invest in. If you read it and pay attention to it, Congress is saying, Hey, here's the things that are really treated. Well, you should be doing those. And it's going to be your friends, rents and dividends. Now you asked about the covered call and let me just explain how this works. A lot of the gurus out there in the trading space, they'll teach you how to lose money. And I've been in this world for a long time. I know there's some people that make money. It's about 5% of short-term traders that are individuals. 5% make money, about 95% lose. It's because they're gambling. If you want to turn it around and be in the 95% category making money, then you want to be the seller. And if you own a security, so let's say I buy Coca-Cola or you know, I'll just use ABC. I buy ABC company, whatever it may be, and I paid $100 a share for it. There's a market that will pay me for the right to buy it by that same share that I paid hundred bucks for, for $101. They might give you 10, 25 cents, something like that per share for the right to buy it at some point in the future, maybe a month, maybe a week, maybe a year, right? The longer the term, the more they'll pay you, which means that I can basically rent that stock portfolio out by selling that option. That's called a call out of the money means it's, it's beyond what I made, what I paid for it. So I might buy a company and I might sell, let's say I paid hundred dollars. I might sell somebody the right to, to, to buy it from me for 105 or, you know, over time as, as the, as the company goes up in value, maybe I start selling it for 110, 120, 130, whatever it might be. Somebody's going to pay me that I get to keep that money, no matter whether I sell them the stock or not. The majority of the time, about 70%, I think is the stat, those options expire. And I, I don't have to sell my company. If those don't expire and somebody wants to buy my company, I can just buy the buy it back from them and sell the next month's out. So if, if it's gone up in value, the next month will eat it. And I'm just punting it down the road and I keep the stock. But I always get to keep the premium that I collected. And that usually generates somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12% a year on your stock portfolio. And that's in addition to the growth. And so when you're a sophisticated trader, I can just tell you that this is what the money managers are almost always doing with your portfolio. There's ETFs that do this. If that's all you did was say, hey, I'm gonna buy good dividend paying stocks. I'm gonna, technically you have to have a hundred shares before you can sell an option, but Let's just say that's all I did is I accumulated a few shares of these companies. I invested in them every month and then I would sell a, a you know, a call out one month or one week or whatever the period of time. And that's all you did. You're going to get a nice return. You're going to have nice cash flow if that's all you did. Now, if, if that's not you and you don't want to learn that stuff, the other thing you could do is avoid money managers and just buy the market, buy the S&P 500. Just and then you have a list of the dividend paying stocks on your website on infinity investing if they sign up for a free account so if somebody wanted to um invest in in dividend paying stock 
there's actually a short list of companies that have a long track record of doing it if they didn't want to get into the covered uh, call type of uh, situation. What what is a good dividend? Uh, like a good like is there a percentage of uh, of a dividend that that our viewers should look for? Above two percent. You want to keep it above two percent above inflation because that's always gonna it's being paid out, so it's not being added to the value of a stock. You know, some of the people they pump their stock price by retaining the asset, which makes the company more valuable. Hey, I didn't pay my employees or I didn't pay my owners. I didn't pay them out profit. Therefore, I've retained more of it. So I'm more valuable. You see companies do this when they cut their working staff. Hey, I'm not having to pay all these people. And now I'm more valuable because I have this capital on hand. That's that's how it works. And the opposite happens when they're paying it out. So when when somebody's paying it out, you want to make sure it's enough so that you're not losing out to inflation. You know, it's the idea of like cash sitting there, not making any interest is losing value every year by the amount of the inflation rate. So it, it's almost like it's it's ice and it's melting. It, it loses its value over time. And we want to avoid that. And so you want to have a dividend that's at least two to 3%. Uh, right now, I could tell you with the markets being all wonky and crazy, you're going to be able to get some really high dividends. Like I, was, I think Altria was like eight eight percent. There's some pretty high ones. You go Chevron, Verizon, AT and T was an interesting one. But you have these companies that pay higher amounts, which is great. But you don't want to really do the one percenters, the stuff that's below uh, inflation, because in theory you're losing value in in, in that company. You want to combat that. So would the benefit of stock paying dividends versus like a Tesla would be that you also get appreciation, but you also get a fixed, not a fixed, but you also get an income stream as well too. And if you invest in enough of that, then obviously that provides one step closer to retirement. Yeah. So there's two ways to get money out of a stock without selling it. Uh -huh. Right. If I have to sell it, then I'm done. So if the only way, like if I have Tesla stock and I have to live, and so I'm in retirement and Tesla loses half its value and I have to pay the utility bill. I have to sell Tesla. Which has gains now, which has capital gains now, right? Potentially right. has capital gains or if it's capital losses, I don't even really get to use them unless I have other capital gains. Like yeah. I can't even yeah. use that against my other income. Um, well, you, you could use up to $3,000 a year, right? But but I still have to sell it. And I don't want to sell it. The whole principle behind infinity is I keep the asset. I don't sell the asset. So I want to make sure that I'm getting the dividend. I want to make sure that I'm getting paid on the option on it. So I need to own the, the security. I need to get paid that dividend and the option. And then there's another way to get money out of it, which is to lever it and borrow against it. There's actually something called a security back line of credit. The same way as I can take a mortgage against my house, I could take a mortgage against my stock portfolio which again, I'm not adverse to the debt so long as you have assets paying it. So let's say that I had a bunch of stock and it's gone up in value and it's worth a million bucks. And there's a great piece of real estate that I could buy that's income producing real estate for 400, 500,000. I could borrow against my stock portfolio to actually go buy that thing outright. And just because I don't have a mortgage on the property doesn't mean I didn't borrow money to buy it. And I could be using that the money off of there and, and using that interest that's still a deduction because it's investment uh, related. And I could just use the cash flow off of the property to pay that back. Like there's, the rich know how to lever properly, but that is a tax free access to money. I can borrow against my uh, real estate. I can borrow against my stocks and that is non taxable income. And if I ever found myself in a situation where there was an opportunity, I don't want to have to sell that asset. I could lever it. Or if I had a, a, an unexpected illness and I, and I became cash poor, you know, I blew through my emergency fund or I just didn't have access to capital. I don't want you to have to sell your income producing assets. You could still lever them if you needed to get over that hump. Is this different than borrowing against your 401k? Yeah. Uh, when you borrow against your 401k, you're borrowing against the plan assets kind of similar, but you're limited to 50%, 50,000 per participant. So if I have a 401k, usually those are invested in mutual funds, unless you control your own 401k. You know, we, we actually like it when you have a solo 401k that you can control it, you're self-directed, you can buy real mm -hmm. estate in it, you can do a lot of really cool stuff, but I can borrow against those plan assets too. So, uh, 
So a husband and wife would be able to borrow up to $100,000. They have to pay it back over five years. And it's at federal AFR rates, which are still really low. They're like 3 4% even now. Mm-hmm. But you could pay that back over time. So there, people don't realize how much access to capital they have. So here you are, Jose, uh, 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 in real estate. And you might have somebody looking for cash flow real estate. And they say, I don't have any money. But they have $200,000 sitting in a retirement and you're like, well, A, you could buy the property in the retirement plan. B, you could roll that into a retirement plan that you could borrow against those assets. Let's say you could borrow up to $100,000, use it as a down payment to buy the property, you know, th- those types of things. The uh, I'll just tell you that the rich do not look at things the same way that the poor do. And I'm not making a disparaging comment against the poor. It's just the rich realize that they have control over their money and they've always tried to figure a way how I can get something done. And, uh, and that's, that's been my experience. So there's a lot of rich people that don't have the money yet. Like they're going to be wealthy. Like you already know who they are. I'm sure that when you were growing up, your, your, your family probably were like, yeah, Jose is going to be wealthy just the way that he problem solves. And it's all up here. It's called uh, the, the locus of control. Once you realize that you're in control of it, that's half the battle. And then it's just finding out what's at your disposal. And that's been my experience with people is that they tend to be way more creative thinkers, but the underlying principle is always the same. They're always trying to find something that's going to pay them over a long period of time and they buy assets and they avoid liabilities. If they do have a liability, it's almost always they're not paying for it themselves. They have revenue streams from their assets that are paying for those liabilities. What about interest and then royalties? Royalties and interest are, you know, they're not in my my favorite wheelhouse because you still have to do some things on them. Uh, royalties, you could be doing uh, oil wells, you could be doing things that are going to uh, generate uh, a royalty stream on them. You could be buying intellectual property that's going to be paying a royalty stream. They're treated as ordinary income. So it's not long term capital gains. It's just your regular tax rate. They are not subject to self employment tax unless you created the let, let's say you wrote a song or you wrote a book or something and you have royalties off it, then that would be active ordinary income if that's what you did. And it's few and far between that I see clients really making that royalty income. But once you create something or you buy something that somebody else created, like maybe I'm investing in something that owns a lot of intellectual property mm-hmm. and it's generating uh, licensing fees, fantastic. Or it's generating a royalty, fantastic. That is fine by me as long as you're not having to work for it. Interest is when you're making money like in a savings account or you're loaning money out. And uh, to me, that's still, there's a little bit of work involved. So it's not always my favorite. It's not a compounding asset. So it's not my favorite, but I still have to look at it. There's lots of folks out there. You hear of something called a private lender or hard money lender, and they do very well making private loans to not, you know non-traditional loans that are non-bank loans. And they charge a little higher interest rate and they do very, very well on it. It's not my bailiwick and you're still having to like, there's still a degree of risk there that I get a little concerned about, but it's still, you're not doing the work. The work is done by the capital that you're loaning to somebody and then they're paying you the interest. Or if you have money sitting in a money market or you have money sitting in a savings account or you buy CDs or T-bills, right? Your money is doing the work and you're getting paid an interest stream as a result. For like royalties, like oil wells and just different types of royalties, how does somebody go about finding those if they wanted to invest into something like that. Ah, you got, you know, so you have to know somebody in that industry. Like you could go to your, uh, chances are if you have like a CFP or you have a good money uh, manager, they're going to have access to to some of the larger, the publicly traded oil and gas concerns, or you're going to go and you're going to be doing private placements. And uh, that's only usually private placements. You could be a non-accredited investor, but it's generally for accredited investors, which is people with a net worth of over a million dollars, excluding their house, or you make $300,000 a year, you're married, married filing jointly for at least three years or $250,000 a year as a, as a single individual. And you anticipate that you're going to keep making that. Then you get access to private placements where they're oftentimes doing these oil wells. I don't really have anybody that I could say, this is a really good oil and gas person. Mm -hmm. They, they're, they're, it's always kind of a hit or miss. I tend to do publicly traded companies like Exxon and Chevron and some of the things like that, 
or you can do some of the petroleum companies that have the big rigs, things like that, where you're, you're investing in publicly traded, but it is included in there because people there, I have clients that are in that realm that they love to do the oil wells because they get ordinary loss treatment. So they're trying to offset uh, one, one gentleman pops into mind. He worked for a publicly traded company as an executive. His buyout was a 10 year buyout. Uh, I mean, when he left uh, employment, he had this long deferred income coming out to him, this big substantial amounts. And he wanted to avoid the payment of tax on as much of it as he could. And he would do a lot of oil and gas because the first year you might see an 80% deduction on your investment because of the, uh, the tax treatment. So it is something that's in your toolbox. But for people that are just learning these concepts, dividend stocks, cash flow real estate, keep it simple. You can learn the others over time, but it would be learn those first two. That's your bread and butter. I know that you said to buy the properties in cash. There's other people that will say um, it's better to leverage the properties because then you, and I guess it depends on the timing of the market. Like had I bought maybe 10 properties in cash in 2010, versus levered 50 properties, then I would be probably in a much better position because the marketplace has appreciated tremendously. What are your thoughts on that? And uh, does it really just come down to if the, if the asset produces cash flow regardless of the debt? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, say, I would say that I've never seen a foreclosure on a property that didn't have debt. <laughs> and I would say that when 2008, 9, and 10, all these people with these highly appreciated homes Mm -hmm. I heard this over and over again, but it's a million dollar property. And then I would say, what are people willing to pay for it? 300,000, but it's a million dollar property. And I'm like, well, it's a $300,000 property and you have $700,000 note against it. Right. So yeah. uh, I tend to look at leverage a little differently. I'm not saying no to it, but you want to make sure that you're not the one paying for it. Because I saw a lot of people go through a lot of financial pain when the market adjusted. E even now, you're looking at people that might have adjustable rate mortgages and they're not feeling very good right now because the, you know, the rates have doubled, <laughs> tripled. They're, uh, yeah. they're, 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 they're not looking forward to the day that that adjusts. And then who like uh, these principles? I know that obviously you've got so many tax returns that you look at. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. that gives you a lot of inside information. Aside from that, like what books or mentors have you had that have kind of like allowed you to think the way that you do? Well, you have the rich dad, poor dads of the world where it, 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 it and that's philosophical, but I had great mentors that I've worked with and great clients. Mm -hmm. And so there's not an original thought in my book. Everything is from tried and true from great people. Everybody from a gentleman that I worked closely with, who was a CFP, David McShane, he's, he's since passed away, but he was, uh, he, w he was an important person because he managed like multi-billion dollar portfolios and the diversification models that we use in the book, you'll, it's very simple, but we break it down. A lot of that was him, uh, Mark A. Latimer, a fantastic trader that I worked uh, with. I've known her for 25 years. She was roommates with one of our attorneys and she took 2000 bucks and blew it up to over $2 million. And I like to use, she's the one that uh, I worked with a lot on the stock market landlord and how to, how to uh, figure out when it's the, the right type of premiums, how to sell the covered calls, when to buy them back and things like that. So I've had really good people that I've worked with my own partner, Clint, we buy real estate all the time. So I could just tell you from a guy that owns hundreds of pieces of real estate, my experience is helpful. But then again, I have tens of thousands of clients that are avid investors too. And I can just say, you can't lie to me. They can't say, oh, I killed it last year because I get to see their financials and I get to look at their tax returns. And I get to say, mm, your numbers tell me something a little different there, brother. Right? So you like, that's why it's it's kind of fun. I get to pull back the 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 curtain a little bit and 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 show what happens uh, backstage from the tax standpoint, where I don't have to listen to what somebody says. I can I can hear their words, but also verify their numbers. And I'm in a unique position. It's funny because I work in check cashing growing up, and I had a client call me recently, and he's like, "Hey, look, I'm about to buy a restaurant. It produces this much. It produces that much. It brings in this much." And he was talking about like the restaurant producing like a 40% profit margin. And I'm just like, ah, that doesn't sound accurate. I think that restaurants are closer to like 10% or even in some cases like five or 6%, you know, with everything that goes into expenses. So 
But being in the check cashing business, I saw a lot of people's check bounce of restaurants that you would think were highly profitable. And they were yep. always busy, but the margins were so low sometimes that it, it one bad thing, which I think is similar to to you, where you get to see like what happened, what actually happens behind closed doors, you know, which I love. We have the gurus. We have the gurus. And so some of the gurus have been my clients, still are, and they're out there and they're like, Yeah, you know, we're making all this great return. And I'm like, dude, you lost money last year. <laughs> they can go out there and tell you whatever. All the talking heads, like this is my favorite, is they have an inverse Kramer ETF. You know, Jim Kramer is out there doing fast mm -hmm. money and they do the opposite, whatever he says, and, and it's up. <laughs> Like the, so the inverse Kramer ETF always seems to do better. Like he's always telling you to invest in things and they tends to like whatever the talking heads are, are, are hawking out there. It, it's, it's not often that it, it, that it does too well. And so, you know, there's, there's the Reddit community that makes fun of these guys and the Twitter community that makes fun of these guys that kind of tracks them and then says, Hey, don't do that. I can tell you from my experiences. Yeah. A lot of people say a lot of things. At the end of the day, money, uh, the numbers don't lie. You want to buy things that are income producing and get, 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 get away from all that fast talking, look at it and say, you know what, if I can, if I can invest a hundred dollars, $200 a month, and I can do that consistently over a long period of time, I'm going to retire. Well, if you're buying assets, if I do the same thing and I'm, and I'm playing the, the gambling game in the stock market, I mean, just look what happened this year. People can just absolutely get torn apart. And it's because the companies that don't actually have a good business behind them, they're always going to go back down to where they, they deserve to be. And the growth stocks is always hype. Buy on the revenue. When you buy a piece of real estate, buy a piece of real estate that's cash flow positive. When you buy a company, buy a company that is cash flow positive. Buy one that's profitable and shares its profits with its shareholders. Avoid everything else. Like if you want to speculate and gamble, go ahead, but do it with your, I don't need it money. Don't do it with your retirement funds. And I see this over and over again. And I, and I live it because my mom it has so much anxiety when the market goes down. That freaks out old people that that's their last of their money. They're not making more. Right. And they're looking at it going, it's down 20%. My God, what am I going to do? And they're not feeling so good. And in my case, I can take care of my mom, but there's a lot of folks out there that don't have people in a position to take care of them and, and, and they're freaking out. And I look at our financial services industry and I'm like, you guys did this. You're creating more anxiety out there because you guys all gamble. Knock it off. Buy good companies that produce good returns, pay out a fair amount to their shareholders and quit messing around. And by the way, statistically speaking, there, there's, a, there's a, a group called Spiva that tracks all this. If you just bought the market, if you just bought a total return ETF or just bought S&P 500, just the whole SPY, mm -hmm. you have a 92% chance to beat all the money market people out there. A 92% chance to beat the professionals over a 15 year stretch. So Toby, if somebody wanted to get involved in infinity uh, investing, how would they go about doing that? And what is the best way to reach out to either you or somebody in your uh, company and also any uh, final words for our viewers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll start with the final words. Yes, you can. You can absolutely do it. And the, the, there's been studies on millionaires. The, the, the top categories of millionaires, this last tranche was engineers, accountants, and teachers. You don't have to be rich to become wealthy period. You just have to just do the right thing over a long period of time and consistently. And you might get lucky. Maybe it pops early, but but don't worry. Yes, you can. Uh, go to infinityinvesting.com. It's absolutely free to join. There is a paywall uh, behind some of the more advanced strategies and where you get access to properties and things like that. But, but you don't need that. Just go right to the free. Start learning the principles. You don't have to go look around for me or anything else. You can go look at the book if you want. It's on Amazon. Uh, highly rated. It got a gold medal with the Global Book Awards. It's the uh, it, it's it's very sound principles. If if you want to get it, like if you have Kindle Unlimited, it's free. Otherwise, you could buy a hard hard bound version or buy a downloaded version. I'm sure. Um, but the principles there, I could say to anybody, if you follow those, you'll get the same results. It's like a recipe. Follow the recipe, you'll get the result. If you start doing something funky or exchanging things or trying to do it too fast, it's like baking a cake. You can't just turn up the heat and, and expect that the cake's going to come out in half the time. 
you're gonna end up with burnt batter, right? Do follow the recipe and you'll get a similar result. That's that simple. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. And if you calculate your numbers, you might be closer to retirement than you realize. Again, I've had 24 year olds, 25 year olds hit infinity. And they were like, that's so easy. And I was like, it's because you're not middle-aged and in debt up to your eyeballs and paying for your kids to go to school. That's why it's easy for you. Do it early and then live a great life. I love it. I love it. For all of our viewers, uh, today we had Toby Mathis. Uh, we talked about how to build residual income. We also talked about his book, Infinity Investing. You heard it yourself. If you want to get involved, go to infinityinvesting.com. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this episode would help somebody, make sure to hit that share button. Until next time, once again, Jose Luis Morales, uh, the Residual Real Estate Agent Show. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, stay tuned for the next episode. And Toby, uh, thanks again for coming on the show.